everybody. I'm a product manager at Google for the past three and a half years. Um, so my brief uh, history at Google started at YouTube, YouTube analytics specifically, doing a very heavy uh, back-end product management, uh, responsible for how like we are aggregating all the user activity on the YouTube site uh, and uh, collecting all this data to our clients, like YouTube analytics, and uh, to our internal uh, analytics purposes. Recently, I moved to local search, which is here in New York. It's basically our uh, search experience and also maps, Google Maps experience for every time that you're searching for places uh, or types of places, like restaurants near me. We're giving you all the information about like the restaurants around you. Recommendation system, we'll touch on this uh, uh, soon. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, this presentation touches my biggest uh, two uh, kind of um, uh, things that I love, uh, machine learning and product management. I'm hoping that, that by the end of this uh, presentation, I'll get you guys also very excited about machine learning and we'll give you some tools about how to do uh, product management for machine learning based products. Um, so I already saw what's the backgrounds here. I'm curious to hear uh, if anyone is already product managing product that has machine learning in its core. Okay. And out of the developers who is implementing machine learning products, Okay, so you're going to answer all the questions with me. <laughs> cool. um, so, machine learning for product managers by a product manager, and it's a very important distinction. I am not an engineer, and I haven't built a lot of those product of uh, those algorithms, but I have enough to kind of interact with engineers and, and make sure that we're doing uh, we're developing great uh, machine learning based products. So, we are going to answer today: A, what role does machine learning have in industry? Big one. Uh, what are the basics every PM needs to know about machine learning and how can PM contribute to machine learning driven products and it's going to have a lot of content I'm going to shove it all in 45 minutes um, do feel free to ask questions uh, because it is a lot and it is complex so do feel free to, to ask and interact uh, but keep the more juicy kind of uh, big questions to the end okay so what role does machine learning have in industry and I will start with a big statement. Welcome to the machine learning era, right? We see machine learning applications all over in all industries, name it, like healthcare, uh, fraud detection, virtual reality, gaming, anywhere. And similarly to how in the early 90s we saw a lot of development on web, web services, right, web, websites, and uh, really uh, developers or product managers pushed the envelope into solving people's problems through web services. And in the early 2000s, it was around mobile apps uh, and mobile development. You can see a lot of the big companies right now thinking about machine learning as the big pillar in which they want to innovate. And it's because it provides like really useful uh, um, value to their users, right? So Google, for example, where I come from, uh, really changed its mission statement to, uh, well, not the mission, but like the approach of solving problems by a machine, uh, through machine learning first. So we are a machine learning first company. We used to be a mobile first company. So you see that trends already um, in, in industry. Um, so let's drill down into like real applications that we see today in machine learning, right? So the very obvious one is facial recognition, where it's from Facebook understanding like some few, uh, getting some few tags of this Francis guy and then suggesting, suggesting new photos uh, on which we can tag more of Francis um, tags. Uh, it's Google Photos that right now clusters a lot of photos, a lot of people around um, from your from your library together into those like right uh, entities and allows you to uh, tag them um, immediately. And also the recent Apple uh, iPhone uh, where facial recognition is the unlock system, right? So facial recognition is a very obvious machine learning application. We see it all over. The second one is recommendation systems. So we see Netflix right now recommended, recommending uh, place, uh, videos or, or um, uh, movies for you. Uh, Spotify does the same, and my personal favorite Google I love to search, which is what I'm working on. Um, these recommendation systems learn from a lot of different user activities, like past user activities, and trying to personally, in some cases, but also um, more, or more globally, suggest next uh, um, places or, or things to you, right? And we'll drill a little bit into like what algorithms and what techniques are used for these type of recommendation systems in a bit. Uh, chatbots and assistants. So uh, 
who here uses Alexa or Google Home or both? Um, so Alexa uh, uses, part of its component is using machine learning, not everything. And if someone is interested, I can walk you a little bit uh, uh, into detail at the end about how this works. But uh, a lot of machine learning technology is used for all these AI-based, uh, or, or all these communication uh, products that try to assist you or to answer your questions. Um, we'll talk about what uh, product, uh, what technology it uses in a second. And not only like big tech companies, right? We, use, we see machine learning everywhere right now. We see it also in medical diagnosis. So you can imagine machine learning algorithms that are looking at photos and trying to understand if it's an abnormal um, uh, photo. So we see a lot of those. We see it also even in agriculture. So I recently learned that uh, there are a bunch of photos, uh, a bunch of cameras positioned in fields trying to look at the quality of the grass and identify if it's under risk or not, so that it will save a lot of money for uh, the farmers. And self-driving cars. I'll ask you, like, what technologies people, uh, like the self-driving cars are using here that are based on machine learning? Wayfinding. Safe. Wayfinding? Sorry. Navigation. Navigation, okay. What else? Machine vision. Sorry, I can't really hear. Machine vision. Machine vision, right. So, right. So for, for a self-driving car to work, it needs to identify all the things around it. It's a pretty complex uh, machine learning model. The actual system is built with different parts. Each part is responsible for one thing. Each part probably has a machine learning mission. Uh, one of them is try, tries to scan all the objects around them and classify them to like road signs, people, other cars, right? And then there is another ma uh, machine learning uh, system that probably de detects, uh, it takes all this information and decides on the next reasonable uh, uh, action for the car, right? So there is a lot of different systems. Generally, machine learning systems are implemented by a lot of sub uh, systems that are trying, to, each is trying to accomplish one thing and all together they're achieving a bigger thing. Okay. And finally, AlphaGo recently beat, uh, uh, won a game of Go against Lee Sel uh, Sedan. I don't know this game, but it's pretty much a big deal uh, for all of my friends at Google. Um, it's uh, basically what we call reinforcement learning algorithm, where you're not really training the model to, exp like to, to do a specific thing. It learns by itself based on the rules on how to ex execute and how to, to play uh, the best way. Um, so that happened recently, and it's been a big deal for us. But why now? So, like, why is that a big deal in 2018, right? And for that, I want to introduce four very exciting exponentials here. So the first one is uh, that we see more computation. We have more computation power, right? So people are familiar with Moore's law here. Okay. So we basically Moore's law says that the number of transistor transistors on a square inch circuit doubles every two years. So we will expect an exponential growth and uh, computation capacity being uh, growing over time, right? And as we will learn, or I mean, you kind of need to believe me on this, all of the machine learning algorithms are like require a lot of data processing and computational power. So that's an essential point, a piece that allows this kind of machine learning era to start. The second exciting exponential is that we have more data. And as we will learn, one of my biggest vision, uh, missions for this uh, presentation today is that you would not think about machine learning as this black box magic, and you will understand that machine learning learns from data, okay? So data is an essential part of machine learning systems. As we get more data, as we collect data about the world, we are able to predict and create more knowledge or train machines to, to uh, to accomplish tasks based on that data. So we see more data in the world. The third exponential is that uh, our <coughs> algorithms become better. So you can see here that like our precision rate for algorithms, for machine learning algorithms, uh, that basically means like how accurate the model is and uh, improves over time. And at some point, I'm sure in 2018, it's like, it's pretty amazing. Um, and then the last one, um, we see a lot of growth in funding, so generally the industry is excited about this uh, domain. Um, so that's just to have in mind. Okay, so covered really quickly um, what role 
um, machine learning has an industry. Um, and um, now we're going to cover what are the basics that every product manager needs to know. And it's a little bit of an oversimplification, so do excuse me. Uh, but uh, hopefully by the end of this, you will understand how machine learning algorithms work. And again, it will move us away from like this black box scenario that a lot of you, a lot of users and product managers have in mind when they're thinking about machine learning. So to start off, uh, let's define what's the difference between machine learning and artificial intelligence. So is there a brave person that is willing to answer that question? And by the way, it's a problem that a lot of people are having. So, yes. That machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. It's one technique that will achieve certain goals that artificial intelligence uses. Perfect. Okay, so let me try to uh, uh, reiterate. Uh, artificial intelligence is a broader concept of machines being able to carry out tasks in a way that we would consider smart. So when a robot walks from this side to the other side, this is a human-like or intelligent kind of action. That is an AI action, right? But it's not necessarily, um, uh, well, let me define machine learning first. But uh, um, machine learning, on the other hand, is a specific application of, of uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, it's based around the idea that we should give machines access to a lot of data and let them make predictions or decisions based on it, right? So again, to my robot example, it walks from one end to the other. That's a human-like behavior. It's intelligent behavior, but it doesn't use it, it, some some uh, robots don't use a lot of data to make predictions, decisions, etc. Okay, so that's like kind of a background for this. And when we are talking about machine learning modules, um, what we are having in mind are four parts. One is a task. So what task are we trying to train the model to do? And I'll touch on this in a second. We give it a lot of data to perform that task. We decide on a technology okay, that we'll use to uh, perform the task based on that data. And finally, we will uh, run evaluation and make sure that we understand how successful this model is. And these are basically mo most of the components that we have in machine learning algorithms today. Um, um, and we, we see them in all, all uh, applications. So let's have the following task as an example. The task is distinguish between a hipster and an old man. Okay? So that's what we want to train the machine learning to do model to do. The data that we will provide, and again, it's an oversimplification, is a bunch of examples like this. This is only one example, and we'll have a lot of different examples, with um, a label. So we will collect examples from the real world that are already annotated for the machine, and then the machine, and we will give it right for, for both the hipster and the old man, and then the machine will take all of those examples and we will create a mathematical model to basically determine what, what is a, a hipster and what is a, an old man, right? So more specifically, it will take all of the examples that I provided to the module and will try to put it in a multi-dimensional space. And then, given that we'll find the technology to basically try and distinguish them. And the technology is like, in a very simple uh, uh, application will be just a linear, kind of finding in the linear graph, a uh, linear um, line uh, in the multi-dimensional space, or it could be a more complex algorithm. The evaluation part uh, will then take another example, an example that the model didn't have or didn't learn from, and will try to put it in the, in the uh, graph to create a prediction, right? Does that make sense? So we, we used all of those examples to create that module, find the line, and then given a new example, um, we, the model will check whether it falls on this side or on that side. And I kind of tricked everyone to find, I found the hipster, like old man, right? So, <laughs> uh, so, so the evaluation bit will basically say, how successful are we to predict something that was never seen before? Um, and, and basically checking how uh, this model performs on an unseen example is what evaluation means. 
Okay, so let's drill into all of this. Uh, so we said, um, I'll, I'll reiterate, sorry, I just want to make sure we're in time. Okay, I'll reiterate, we have a task, in this case was like a hipster or not hipster or old man, right? The data, we gave a lot of data. Uh, we chose some sort of technology to draw a line in some mathematical graph, and then we did some evaluation to test its success, right? So now I'm going to drill into each of those and talk about the different uh, types of tasks, data, and tech that we are using uh, to accomplish different types of um, machine learning algorithms or machine learning tasks. Okay, so when we're talking about tasks, the more, more common, most common ones are classification, reg regression, and sequences. So a classification is kind of what we've talked about now. Given a, an example, is that a old man or is it a hipster? Uh, usually you ask one question, is it an old man or is it a hipster, right? I was trying to be funny. But um, <laughs> what's important to understand here, um, I'll talk to you later actually. Um, a classification, another classification example could be like given an example, is it a man or not, right? So that's kind of like a binary yes or no on a given, on a given question. A regression algorithm will give us a continuum. So it's not a specific yes or no, and it just kind of answers your question. The confidence sometimes correlates to the regression. But um, the, the regression will give you a value from 0 to 100, usually, about a specific um, uh, question. So in this case, like how old is this person? Or how likely this person is? Um, another example would be how likely this person is to live in Bushwick or something like that. So it's, it's kind of like a, con a, 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 a probability or, or different uh, options for a result. Make sense? In sequences, we're looking at various different examples to predict the next likely example. Um, so applications for this will be like weather prediction, um, what else? Uh, for self-driving cars, like what should be the next movement for that car, or the next action for that car, right? Um, so it takes a lot of different examples from past to predict the next. These are the, like, the most common tasks that we're given today. So let me come back to like, um, uh, our recommendation system. So my, my recommendation system uh, at Google, uh, when you search for restaurants, I'm giving you some recommendations. What type of task is this? in your mind. I think it's, it's, it's hard because you need to think about the question we're asking and the question there is like what restaurants are likely to match your query or likely to match you specifically if we're doing like personal recommendations, right? And in that case, it's actually a regression because we will pick the ones that have the most likelihood to agree with your preferences or with your query or whatever, right? So this is, this is kind of, it's, it's hard but this is kind of, uh, oversimplification of our uh, system. Okay, and now we're talking about data. So we said that we need to give the system a lot of data to accomplish the task of predicting, classifying, or give us a regression score, or uh, sequences, right? So when we're talking about data, uh, we're talking about examples that we give to the system, and each example have features and labels. So the features, in this case, will be um, all the things that basically uh, um, together uh, represent the example, the specific example. So in this case, it will be like round glasses, beard, and that uh, plaid shirt, and all of these are for that specific example valid, right? So you can think about it as like a vector, and each of them is like, is each uh, uh, part of the vector is, like, is a value between zero and one. It's like, does it have round glasses? Yes. Does it have a beard? Yes. Does it have a plaid shirt? Yes. Does it have white hair? If we're trying to distinguish between like a hipster or old man? No, in this case, right? So we give that vector as well of features into the model as well as the label. So we say this vector represents a hipster. In another example, sorry, I didn't put it here, but in another example of an old man, we will give a different vector. Some of those features will actually also be valid for this old man, for this hipster, right? So you can imagine a, an example of a, 
of a bearded old man, right? So they have a beard, but the label, the actual uh, 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 ground truth for that example is an old man, right? So the model will take all of these examples, we'll, we'll give it you know, thousands of examples, and we'll start identifying what features and what uh, collections of features are actually crucial to predict hipster, or actually crucial to predict old man. Yeah? Okay. Um, given the data that you have, um, and so data limitations, you need to kind of choose your approach of uh, what, what task you can perform. Um, so in a supervised learning um, algorithm, and this, these are terms that you'll hear a lot if you're working on machine learning products, um, every example, uh, the, the, sorry, the model learns from examples uh, that are labeled. So it will, we will give it a bunch of different examples, and each of them will be either a hipster or an old man, or yes, hipster, not hipster, etc. right? So the responsibility of the model is to say, is it a hipster or not, right? That's the, the classification algorithm that I gave as an example <laughs> at the beginning. Um, for instance, Apple, uh, for facial recognition, it takes a bunch of photos of you, right, and learns the important uh, features to then look at another example that it, doesn't, it didn't see and uh, say, is that the person, the, the owner? Yes or no, okay? In unsupervised learning, we do not give those labels. We don't have the label. So we don't know if that's a hipster or, it's an, or an old man. We have the features, right? But we don't know how to label it. And, and this is very common because getting the data is really difficult, generally, in machine learning, right? So uh, in unsupervised learning algorithms, what the, resp the responsibility of the model will be to start identifying the features that are similar to cluster the space um, together, right? So examples for that will be actually our uh, Photos app, right? It's all facial recognition, but doing different things, right? The Photos app looked at all of my photos, all, of my, all the people in my photos, and collect and, and clusters clustered all of them together into entities. It doesn't know what's their name because we've never labeled it, right? But it understood the different features or the different uh, relationships between features to be able to cluster these in high accuracy, right? Another example is uh, Google News, right? It looks at web pages, understands um, what are the main topics of each document of each web page, and clusters it together uh, into one topic. So it won't show you like the same article from New York Times and from Washington Post, etc. Okay? Without real labels, because nobody's going to annotate in real time every day, like what is this about, right? Okay. Semi-supervised uh, learning is a case where we have a little bit of um, uh, labels, um, but the rest, so in this case, the, the algorithm can cluster still things. In this case, like it clustered all the people with the you know the walking stick together, and all the people with the I don't know the beard to that side. I don't know what I put here. Um, uh, in this side, and using the labels, it could make like assumptions about what this cluster is about, right? And uh, an example for this is our Facebook example. So Francis actually tagged himself in few cases. Now we can take another photos uh, that are similar to Francis and also suggest that label for them, right? Okay, so that's about the data. Now we're talking about the tick. So again, we took all the examples and we want to create, to, to train a model to perform a certain task, right? Classification, regression. Um, the tech is basically the, the mathematical model that we'll use to accomplish that task. And obviously it, uh, it correlates to the type of task that you want to do. Some tasks you can only do with one tech versus the other. Oversimplification here, but we'll try to cover like the most common ones. So just to recap, we took all the examples, and all models basically put them in some multi-dimensional space, right? Based on the features. So you can, for example, yeah, an oversimplification. This axis represents whether you have a hat. This one represents whether you have a beard. Uh, not you, the example, right? <laughs> uh, this, uh, this axis represents whether you have a plate shirt, etc. So it's, it puts all of those examples 
in a multidimensional space, and then it starts drawing some lines, right? So in a linear um, classifier, it will try to put a straight line, okay? Um, in a Um, in a nonlinear classifier, it, it basically creates a nonlinear, um, uh, forget the word, graph. Yeah. In deep neural networks, which is a very common uh, machine learning uh, technique right now, what it does is is completely different. It's it's more it's more complex. So what it does. And I'll try to do this quickly, but do feel free to reach out if you're excited about this later. Um, it looks into all the features, one example at a time, and tries to identify what features and in what features combinations, um, uh, what features and what feature combinations have the most weight to predict the task or to, to help us assist, uh, um, uh, reach the task. So for instance, in example number one, we saw those features. And then the model says, okay, you, when you see all of these features and, and, and this label, all of these features basically mean that this is a hipster. But then another example came, right? And notes how in both cases the beard is still there. So, sorry. Another example came of an old man this time. So now it's assessed and saw, okay, wrinkles, that's probably a very a clear indication of an old man. Uh, the fact that it has old man friends uh, is another <laughs> indication. Uh, whether it has a beard suddenly doesn't make, like, uh, we don't know, right? So it changes the weight for that specific feature. Then it takes the combination of features. So um, in that case, a uh, plaid shirt with wrinkles, and it starts to understand how the combination of those features are actually uh, helpful in predicting whether it's an old man or, or a hipster, right? Probably if you see like uh, wrinkles is a more important signal or feature than um, whether it's a plaid shirt or not, because a lot of old men uh, wear uh, plaid shirts, right? So it takes a lot of those examples and every time tries to under ch assess what are the new weights that we need to uh, give to each feature into predicting. So then in a, a new example that the model haven't seen, it looks at all of those features of that example and, say, and says, okay, uh, that example has a plaid shirt and a walking stick. Oh, we know that that actually, like the walking stick wins, wins right? In most cases, walking sticks make, uh, uh, determine that it's a old man. So this is kind of how we're, our neural networks, right? Like we're looking at a lot of examples and over time we're understanding what are the most important uh, features that help us make a prediction or decision or what are the things that are actually uh, uh, important into making uh, some sort of a task, right? Accomplishing some, any task. So, so how, yeah. how is the final decision to say, say if the walking stick is the biggest factor versus How is that ultimately determined? What process or yeah. at the end result is, is there a human saying that that's right or is it through the yeah. different number of examples? Okay, so let me let me say uh, walk you through the process again. Okay, I'm giving there is one one uh, stage that is the training stage of the algorithm where we're giving it a bunch of different examples that are annotated, and we call it the golden set. A lot of features and a lot of labels, right? Uh, all the features, uh, let's say 50 examples of the hipster, and 50 examples of old man, right? And the model takes all of those examples and understands, processes them, and says, okay, which, uh, uh, over time, understands what are the most important features to predict, right? And obviously, it's not down to only like one feature. It's a combination of features, and and at the end, the result will be a likelihood, right? Um, it creates this model that basically uh, allows you to enter a new example that the model haven't seen ever, right? In order to uh, and, and basically uh, make a prediction about that example. Does that make sense? Right, but it's happening inside 
So you get 50 examples, and is it creating its own algorithm that says when the next, after, you know, when the new picture comes in, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at it and say walking stick is 60% and yeah. white hair is 30% and like it creates that yes. on its own? Yes. It looks at the example, understands all the fe understand all the features, and then make a prediction based on the how important are those features in the model into predicting or making that, accomplishing that task. Yes. So I think what you said is kind of correct. Yes. Uh, this is going back a bit, but in your previous example about multi-dimensional analysis, what defines a dimension? So, uh, in this case, a yes. dimension is a feature. A feature. Yeah. So, based on how many features you have, it can be 50 dimension or a 5,000 dimension. Yeah. Okay. That's why I need a lot of computational power right. <laughs> and a lot of data. To, to do it right, because if I only show them play charts, they don't know. They, they wouldn't know. Right? Yes? In the other slide, you have uh, uh, layers, uh, hidden layers. Yeah. Hey, yeah. yeah. Are hidden layers combination of features? That's super oversimplification, but yes. Like, it's, it's basically how those features in relation to other features uh, uh, help you predict or accomplish the task. But yes. You'll need to learn this more to get exactly all the answers. Yes. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about a fourth uh, technology or technique. Uh, in this case, it's called reinforcement learning. Um, in this case, uh, we're basically training an agent or our uh, uh, machine learning model to accomplish a task, and we're only giving it rules. In this case, the rule is you need to go from this point, the yellow top one, to the green one. And uh, every time you hit the color, you get one point. And every time you uh, hit a black um, uh, space, you sub subtract minus three. And your goal is to get the most, num the, the highest score at the end, right? So the agent basically starts by trying. And and it doesn't know the rules, right? It, it basically tries, and we, we teach it, we give it the result, right? But those rules are known to us. For instance, if I know how to play uh, AlphaGo, right? I know the rules, the agent doesn't, right? But it learns over time by playing and trying a lot, right? Okay, so the agent tries an action. It tries to go through this line, right? And um, we are giving it four back, right? So now it looks and it tries to understand what are the features of the things, of the decision that, or the action that it made, right? And understand, okay, I've seen some yellow, I've seen a green, maybe there is something about yellow, green, I don't know. Okay, let's try another one, right? Um, it does another action and it gets the reward seven. Okay, so now it has another uh, information to work with, right? So over time, as it tries different uh, techniques or different actions, it will converge into a uh, a technique or, or a strategy uh, that could be sometimes similar to how we're thinking about solving the problem, like in chess or in AlphaGo, sometimes could be completely different. Yes? Does this um, try every possible combination or...? Um, I think there is like, a, the reinforcement is, uh, I think so, yes. Oh, yes. So Brute force, you just try everything. Well, you, you can't oh, you can't do all of them, so it will need to like slice away some uh, options as it learns, or like go only in like the most probable uh, direction, because there are too many. Oops, sorry. Okay, so that's about reinforcement learning. So recapping techniques is basically how we're using all this data and examples that we have into creating modules models that can uh, accomplish a task. And then, given an unseen example, uh, it will be able to accomplish a task for that unseen example. Okay. So when we're talking about evaluation, we're talking about how successful is this model, right? How uh, how good is our machine learning model? And when we're talking about evaluation, we're focusing on two different um, points: recall and precision. Um, so that's a little confusing. Uh, but recall is basically. Out of all the examples of hipster I give the model, how many can the algorithm successfully find? Okay, so basically uh, I'm giving it 100 examples, 
it can find, uh, identify correctly as hipster, 70 of them. So that means that my model is 70%, uh, the recall of my model is 70%, okay? Precision is a little different and it's very nuanced. The precision means, given one example, what, are the, what is the chance that the algorithm will classify it correctly as a hipster? So that now I'm giving you one photo, how likely the model is to say if it's correctly, uh, uh, sorry, how correct, uh, likely is the model to say uh, that the, the photo is a hipster, um, sorry, how, sorry, how precise, so is that, when I give it that example, is it a real, uh, would it uh, correctly identify if it's a hipster or not, okay? And we'll give an example about this in a second. So to get that evaluation, to get to that evaluation step, we uh, set aside what we call a testing set. So when we collect all of that data, part of it is saved to train the model, right? Part of it is also saved so that I can feed it to the model after it was trained to test if the model is performing correctly or not, right? Because I need, I need examples that I know about them uh, and know if they're a hipster or old man in order to evaluate what's the uh, precision or what's the recall of my machine learning algorithm. Okay? Yeah. What would be, what would you use for the recommendation engines for like restaurants and Google? Okay, so how we do it is <laughs> basically, yeah. So what we do is we go and ask people and, uh, and what is like the response to that query at that location a good response, right? And then you ask a lot of people, and, and we have techniques to collect this from, um, it's like contractors, right? Um, and then we evaluate our uh, model against their response. That No magic, like that's how you train models, you collect the data. It's similar to the CAPTCHA, uh, whenever you go into a website and try to put in a password and still it tries to make you circle, um, choose certain squares, you know, this is very similar. I'll like you give them a, a test set. Yeah, I'll, I'll touch this in a second. Okay. Um, okay. So very simple. Uh, to recap, we have a task, we have data, tech evaluation. Um, hopefully by now it doesn't feel like a black box, but it's a little bit more tangible, like how this magic is happening. Do come to me if you have questions at the end about this. So the most important part. Um, okay. Let me see, I have six minutes. Okay, so how can PMs contribute to machine learning driven products, right? Um, so, the first thing is you know your machine learning, right? And high level, you don't, I mean, probably a little bit more deeper than what I, I described. Now, I'm going, I, all of those uh, terms are the things that you'll hear your engineers talking about. Hey, what's a precision? What's a recall? What are we optimizing for? And uh, what uh, is the task that we're trying to accomplish, right? So understanding those terms is really important. will set you uh, up to, for success with your engineers and, and developing good products. The second thing, uh, which is not trivial, um, is help the team decide what to optimize for. So here's an example, right? Back to our um, Facebook classifier. 95% recall means that out of all Francis's photos, um, so all the photos that contain Francis, uh, we will suggest 95% uh, of them as tag for, as a Francis tag, right? The high precision of like 95 will be 95 of, of the suggested photos for an auto tag really have Francis, right? And we know that because we have the golden cell data, we tested our, um, um, algorithm against it. Um, what do you guys think? Uh, what, which one is more important? What did you say? Golden. Golden set. Uh, golden data is basically uh, the testing set. It's the data that we're keeping and saving aside to test the model uh, against it, so that we can say if it's like, so we can understand what's a precision and what's a recall for that model. Okay. Sorry, a lot of terms here. So, which one is more important? Uh, as product managers, high recall or high precision? High precision. Why? Well, I would say high precision because let's say you're at your doctor's office and you get you get tested for a disease. 
it'd be it'd be much better to test or test true for a disease that you don't have than to test false for a disease that you do have, like a type one or type two error. So it really depends on the application. I think I would personally, as a product manager for this uh, product, will prefer precision than recall because I don't really care how many uh, of those photos uh, we auto tag for you, but every time that we tag something, it must be correct, right? So that's my personal product manager uh, decision here, right? But those are the type of uh, product management, like that's that, those are the type of questions that I get all the time from my engineers, and I'm responsible for like deciding on them because it, it translates to the end product for my user, right? Like the user will see if we got it wrong. <coughs> I need to assess if it's important or not, if it's it's problematic or not, right? So. Oops. Um, so speaking about data and what are we focusing on, um, it's important to know that sometimes machine learning isn't the answer, right? So if I have a very good uh, spam detection uh, machine learning model that is correct 90% of the time, right? But we, only, but we know that only 1% of emails are going to be spam. Do I need a machine learning model or not? In that case, it's actually better for me to just ignore and, and ignore spam and, and not solve the problem, not develop a machine learning algorithm um, for spam detection, because I'm going to be wrong 10% of the time, whereas only 1% of, of the uh, uh, emails are, are spam, right? So you really need to understand how you're doing against like what's the real situation or real, the pro real problem in life, right? And engineers, at least my engineers, will always try to solve the problem in the most complicated way, and sometimes it's actually important to just say, no, like we don't need to uh, uh, do that. Okay, number three is think about machine learning early in the product design. Okay, and why is that important? It's because some products and some things are only possible because of machine learning. And I think that Google Photos is one amazing example of this. Like they took a product that is basically like a repository of photos and made it all magical, right? It now understands who are your pets and who are your friends and shows you all the photos from your trips trip in Paris, right? So it really created a whole new level of experience. And I think it's really cool to think about machine learning early in the experience in the development process if you can, if you're in a good position to do that. Um, um, and then number four is collect the right data. Um, when we're trying to train like recommendation systems, we need to make sure that the data we're training the recommendation system against, or the machine learning algorithm, is not biased, is accurate, etc. If I, for instance, only train the model based on male users, what recommendation system would I build? Action. Exactly, or if, if we can be, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, action, or things that are, are just more male popular, right? So your responsibility as product managers is to identify or to make sure that the data that we're feeding the model isn't biased, right? Because then the machine learning algorithm will not be correct, even with the best algorithm or best technique, right? Um, another example of well, so another example is that if you try to, for instance, create a recommendation system uh, or recommendation system for YouTube and you learn only from like the 99% use case of YouTube or something like that, you'll very quickly start uh, uh, suggesting cat videos for everyone, right? Um, I'm joking, but like you got the idea. You need to really make sure that your data represents what you're trying to achieve um, in the product, even if it's like the, the minority case, and it's not the 99 usage of the app. Um, and then let users give feedback and log it. It's very important. Um, so a lot of the, the machine learning algorithms, one second, um, uh, they learn over time. So we are training those modules every time, every day, based on new, fresh examples. And one of the ways to get those fresh examples or fresh um, data is by collecting it from real users. So, for instance, this is Google Now, right? And uh, <coughs> we are showing you some stories that we think are relevant to you. Um, as you interact with those stories, 
um, uh, you say I like it, I don't like it, we rem remember it, we log it, and then we can see how our model is doing, but also we can use some of these data to train a new model, right? Because this is golden data, this is the real data that we can use then for the model. Um, one thing as product managers is to think really, really carefully what data are you collecting, right? Because if I'm swiping left here, what does that mean? It's like removing this, swiping left. What does that mean? I don't want it. One potential option. That's why they removed it. But the other option is that the user actually finished read it, reading it, right? So that's not a good like data collection mechanism, although it's an awesome interaction for a user, right? So from a machine learning product manager standpoint, you really need to think, okay, what are we, what are we collecting and what signal does that represent, right? So your point, what if we don't have data, right, to collect? or we, we need to uh, start somewhere, right? So if we don't have data, you can crowdsource the problem. Uh, there are um, services like Amazon Mechanical Turk that you can and pay a very small fee per each example, so like 0 0.025 cents for um, uh, getting the data, and people will do that for you. Um, another example is what you m mentioned about reCAPTCHA, which is like secretly, um, companies getting your data from you uh, without most of people understanding, right? So like, in this case, it tries to understand if you're a robot or not, and it says, select all the oranges. So it selected, uh, I selected as a user too, right? So now we have one golden example. We need to remember that it's like, people will sometimes be incorrect, so we might want to validate this over and over, maybe two or three times before we confirm that this is an orange, but that's how we collect uh, golden data. Right? Uh, or that's one approach of how to collect of golden data. I'm finishing. Uh, the fifth thing is think about the user experience. Uh, you're the responsibility for that, right? So, how would users react to new features? Um, generally, people, or at least people from uh, not, not the recent ones, uh, not Gen Z, but like millennials like me, are freaked out by, private, by machine learning. They don't understand why we know everything about them. Um, when we are launching new machine learning product, products, we need to really think carefully about the user and how they're going to react with it, uh, to it, right? So one technique like Amazon did here is kind of like simplifying the machine learning to users in a way that will help them understand what, what they're trying to do, right? So frequently bought together, it's probably an oversimplification of what the machine learning product is doing, but, it, but they gave it the label, and they, that's it. Like, it's frequently bought together from now on. Like, you don't need to worry about this. We're not doing anything more freaky behind the scenes, or it's just a little bit more uh, simplified, uh, simple for users to understand this. So really think about how we're not creating a black box for users, and then hopefully they'll get your, you'll get their trust. Um, if you can justify and explain your machine learning as much as possible, that sometimes could help. Um, I'm excited. Uh, about that specifically because that's uh, like my biggest challenge right now is to understand how users are going to react to a machine learning prediction that I'm making and one of the ways is really explaining how we made that prediction. So it's not an easy task because machine learning don't like output is not giving you all this information but you can think about uh, ways of, of uh, bypassing it and give you the uh, justification. Make sure you have fallback options so you can imagine what will happen if uh, we only launch this without like falling back to something like this, right? Like uh, engineers will be excited about launching only this, but you, you always need to like have some fallback to your users. And finally, add policy layer. I'm sure you've heard about K-Tweets and the, the is it Microsoft bot that was trying to like uh, tweet like a young millennial. Uh, people abused it and started like to be really aggressive and, 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 and uh, cursing online, right? So think about how you control your machine learning as product managers. One simple way is to add a policy layer, uh, a blacklist of words that are not allowed to be as an output or stuff like this, right? To recap, know your ML, decide what to optimize for, think about machine learning early in the product design, collect the right data, and think about the user experience that you're creating. And that's it, thank you so much.